this is part one in a series of videos in which I'll be looking at this and trying to repair it. If you're not familiar with this, it's an ADM 3A. Uh, we used to call them dumb terminals. And what this is, it's not a computer, it's actually just a, an interactive terminal. So what it's for, if you've ever used something like a hyper terminal on a PC to talk to an Altair, then this is equivalent to um, hyper terminal, but in a hardware form. Uh, it normally communicates through something like RS-232 to a remote computer and it allows you the same level of control and interaction that a program such as Hyper Terminal uh, would uh, afford you. And it's simply for that, it's for displaying information coming in from that computer on the screen and through a keyboard you can send commands and information back to the PC or the computer um, via a serial link. It looks extremely complicated it is extremely complicated and I've worked on these before and they all strike me as being designed by somebody who was given a copy of a TTL a data book for Christmas and decided to work his way through every single page and include every single device that was in there. Uh, they do seem uh, excessively complicated for what they are because almost everything is done uh, with glue logic, it's all discrete um, logic. There are a couple of LSI chips in here. There's nothing else in the case apart from the display and the power supply. I haven't taken this apart. This is how it um, was delivered to me. Uh, as ever, it's not mine. I'm repairing it for somebody else. And um, I'm not quite sure exactly what state this is in. I believe the owner has powered it up and that uh, it initially worked and then stopped working. Uh, the usual uh, story there. Uh, so again, my advice, if you find something like this, do not turn it on until uh, you've been through it fairly carefully. Uh, all manner of uh, damage can occur, and with um, something as complex as this, it can be very difficult trying to get it to, to work again. I do have the service manual for this, which makes a nice change. I don't know how accurate the schematics in that will be. Um, but what I'm going to do in this video is just have a quick look around the board. We'll have a quick look inside the case and then uh, in the next video we'll start trying to fault find and see uh, how big a task we have ahead of us. So firstly we'll have a quick look around the board. So despite the size of the board there's not actually that much to see. Uh, we have the power supplies at one end and down the side. Uh, we've got the interface connections along with the line drivers and receivers in the centre at the back. Uh, we've got the board rate etc selection at the front left keyboard, keyboard interface and all the glue logic to allow the keyboard to work we've got some memory, this unit will buffer around a thousand characters and then we've got the uh, asynchronous receiver and transmitter which is really the only large scale integration device on the board uh, so it's, it's quite straightforward as I say it's mostly glue logic so most of the functionality of this is done entirely on the fly through the, um, uh, the 74 series logic that are festooned around the board. There's no other large scale integration, there are no components on the other side. This is just a two sided board and so it should be quite an interesting board to work on. It is uh, quite big and the main thing with these types of boards are they do draw uh, a lot of power and quite often when they start to go wrong you can get a, a kind of cascade failure on them uh, but if you watch the last video I made on the Wren then you'll know that sometimes you get into a situation with these where uh, as components start to age uh, the performance of them starts to degrade and then you start to get problems that um, uh, are hard to track down. I hope that's not the case with this. I haven't tried powering it on. Um, what I'm going to do with this before I try and power it on is give it a really good clean. It is uh, filthy, there's a lot of dirt uh, on the top of it and especially on the power supply. And uh, I also want to pop the keys off and make sure there's nothing down in the keyboard. Uh, there's no guard on this keyboard so it could be full of junk. Uh, and then I need to have a good look round and uh, figure out if, it, if there's anything obviously wrong with it. I'll measure across the supplies make sure there's no shorts 
uh, there are some tantalum capacitors on here we've got the large electrolytic at the back so I'll need to uh, take that out and test it uh, and then we've got the power devices and one of the issues with boards like this because they're so big and flexible you'll notice that when I move it you'll see these flexing relative to each other and quite often the uh, pins can snap off of these where they join the board so I need to check all these and there's some more on this side other side of the board extremely good condition there are a few scrapes on it I need to check to make sure there's no damage on the track there's one fairly deep gouge here doesn't look too bad um, but I just need to go over this and see if there's anything uh, dry joints that sort of thing but it does look to be in exceptionally good condition on this side so nothing really to uh, write home about it's not particularly exciting but it is interesting if you're into um, electronics like this and you want to see how they went about uh, designing and developing something of this nature. Now it, it is plain that it's been worked on before because these two memory chips are in sockets whereas all the rest are sold to the board and these are also a different date code. If you're interested the date code on these seems to vary between 78 and 79 so I believe this was built sometime early 79 uh, so uh, obviously uh, very old around 40 years old so has fed uh, quite well. So I get the chassis, we'll have a look at that, uh, we'll have a look inside, see how it's laid out and uh, see if there's any damage that we need to be uh, concerned about. Okay, so looking at the chassis, we can see it's not in too bad a condition, needs a good clean. I want to try and get permission off the owner to remove this sticker, um, make it uh, look a lot neater. Um, I haven't touched this yet, the wire was hanging out of the side when it arrived. Um, so we'll try lifting up the cover. I have not looked inside this yet, uh, it's been hanging around for a week or so and I haven't yet uh, opened it so let's have a look inside. Very heavy tube that's in this. Okay I'll move the camera a bit further forward so we can see inside. Okay so looking inside we have a huge transformer and um, I'll let you know the specs of all these once I've had a chance to uh, look at the, uh, the manual. Uh, I've got a fuse down in this corner, power switch which is tucked underneath the back and these are just the connections that go to the uh, main PCB and then we've got the PCB supports. So again not a lot to see in there, although we've got a grounding post on a plastic case, it's a strange way of doing that. And then uh, with regard to the terminal itself, uh, this terminal is almost identical in terms of the circuit to the one that was in the uh, IBM 5120. If you've seen the videos I posted on that machine, uh, then this uh, uh, circuit is almost identical to that. 12 inch uh, tube rather than 9 inch, but the actual driving board is very similar. So I'll probably do the same thing I always do with these and uh, make up a, a simple jig just to test this in isolation from the uh, main board. Uh, I believe the owner said that it did light up but I want to just make sure that it's uh, behaving itself before I try plugging it into the board. Uh, I'll look around see if I can find a replacement tube for this to uh, deal with the cataracts otherwise uh, I'll leave that up to the owner to deal with but um, these tubes were fairly common so with any luck we can find a replacement for this. The rest of it's all fairly straightforward and standard, there's nothing uh, complex in here at all, nothing particularly exciting. So, okay, I'll close it back up and we'll go back to the board and decide what the uh, plan of attack should be. Okay, I've had a, a quick look around the board and there doesn't appear to be any real significant physical damage. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll get this cleaned up and then in the next video we'll look at uh, testing the supply, testing the power rails on this uh, and then we'll get as far as trying to power it up. There are about 160 ICs on this board, uh, most of them soldered into place so this may be an ideal candidate for using the uh, logic comparator uh, should we need to test any of these devices. Uh, I don't know how easy this board will be to work on. It looks fairly good, so I'm hoping that if we do need to replace any ICs, then we can do that fairly easily and uh, we can get them in and out without uh, doing any real damage to the board. 
Okay, so that's it for this video. Um, if you know anything about these or if you've used them, um, then uh, please leave a comment.